I'm going to talk to you today about career pathways in horticulture, how to get into it, and um, some of the sorts of different aspects of the industry that are maybe slightly lesser known. I do have a bit of a cold and a cough, so please excuse me if I have a bit of a cough and a splutter in the background here and there. Um, so my name's Amber Crowley. Um, I work for UHI um, Argyle and um, I'm a curriculum lead there. So I line manage lecturers in horticulture and other land based subjects in um, the sea based subjects as well as so aquaculture and maritime and in social sciences. Um, but my career has really been in horticulture and I lecture in horticulture. Um, so a little bit of background on me and and my um, career and how I've come to the point that I am now in horticulture. Um, my family have a wholesale propagation plant nursery. Um, that's a picture of it there in the middle um, on the west coast of um, Scotland um, in Argyll, just south of Oban. Um, so I've kind of been grown up in horticulture um, through and through. Um, I then went and studied a biology degree, um, but then decided I wanted to do something a little bit more creative. So I did a HND in garden design. Um, I then worked in garden design and landscaping and had a company in Edinburgh. Um, we ended up doing public and private gardens all through the UK and uh, some in Europe also. Um, and there's a couple of examples of gardens around there. And I was lucky enough to um, have show gardens at the Chelsea Flower Show and at Gardening Scotland for a few years there. There's also a picture of um, a bottle of gin at the top there, um, not just because I like gin, although I do, um, but I also work as a horticultural consultant. Um, so I advise horticultural businesses um, on any aspect of their business, really on growing, um, on selling. Um, and Lassa Gin, which is a small uh, gin producer on the Isle of Jura, um, asked me to come in and uh, mentor their business so that I could help them uh, to grow the botanicals that they need on Jura to flavour their gin. So they have over 20 botanicals and they want to be completely sustainable and self-sufficient in everything that they can grow there, but it's a very challenging growing environment. So there's lots of uh, different aspects of horticulture and I've been very lucky uh, through my life to work in a few areas. People often think horticulture is just gardening, isn't it? And we hear that opinion um, very often um, from kids in school, um, from the public. And is it true? That's the question. Is horticulture gardening? And I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, there is a sector of horticulture which really is gardening and it's absolutely fabulous. It's a wonderful section of um, of the industry. And that could be garden maintenance like at the top there where people are working to maintain um, gardens, to create and maintain gardens. And that might be public parks, um, public or private gardens, botanic gardens, estates. Um, it requires people who are gardeners through and through pure gardeners. It also requires people who can supply plants, people who can um, supply materials, people who can manage teams of people. We have also in here landscaping, which is a form of gardening, certainly we're creating gardens, public and private gardens, streetscapes. Again, landscapers are required, gardeners are required, managers are required. Uh, but then we have all of the other sides of it going alongside that, the machinery side of it, equipment side of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have garden design, which is also a form of gardening. Um, and that's obviously an area that I know quite a lot about, but uh, it's designing public and private gardens. Um, it crosses over into landscape architecture sometimes, um, but garden design also involves a lot of detail with planting design. <coughs> So those are the sort of more gardeny sides of it, but the industry is much bigger than that. And I'm having a look at this list, not completely in the order that uh, I wrote it in. Um, I'm going to go to the second one now, to production horticulture. And this is a big area um, of the industry, and it is the production of ornamental plants, uh, which might be hardy ornamental nursery stock, herbaceous perennials, bedding plants, all of the sorts of plants that you see um, in the garden centres. But also we have the production of fruit, vegetables, mushrooms. 
and to cut flowers. Um, all of that is under production horticulture. So it's going on um, all across the country, indoors, in glass houses and in polytunnels and outdoors as well, depending what people are growing. And it's quite a big industry. Um, we then have a boroculture and a boroculture sits partly in forestry and partly in horticulture. Um, people come into it from both sides or sometimes just go straight into our boroculture. It involves tree surgery, surveying, woodland management. Um, and so sometimes people come into that from their planty knowledge or sometimes people come into it from their forester knowledge. Um, so that sits a kind of as an industry that crosses over. We have large retail and sales um, and industry in horticulture, all the garden centres, plant outlets, <coughs> um, and they need sales assistance, they need management, they need sales reps, they need horticultural equipment, they need people to sell consumables. So there's a big supply side as well as the garden centre side of people actually selling the plants in retail. There's also quite a lot of online retail going on these days, more and more. Lots of nurseries are branching out into, branching out, excuse the pun, um, branching out into uh, retail, online retail. And that's something that can be done without a big investment um, into a garden centre space, but straight from the growing space. <coughs> we then have um, therapeutic horticulture. And this is an area that's rapidly growing and involves several horticultural charities that are really quite big who are supporting people to deliver horticultural therapy or therapeutic horticulture. And the thinking is more and more that most people in the world could benefit from some therapeutic horticulture. Um, some people for real specific reasons like um, recovery from injury or illness, um, through additional support needs, through disability, through rehabilitation of some kind, but also everybody benefits from going outside, working with plants, spending time in green spaces. The therapeutic horticulture is used for community projects, um, for the care services, um, for hospitals, for schools. So it's quite a big um, area of the industry and it's really growing. Even these days, doctors will actually prescribe some time in green space or some therapeutic horticulture um, for people for physiotherapy, for example, or for people with um, mental health problems, um, spending time in green space, productive time growing plants um, can be really helpful. There's education, so schools, colleges, universities, um, trainers and assessors, um, all delivering horticulture at all sorts of different levels into primary schools, secondary schools, through the colleges and universities, but also in the workplace, delivering training and assessing to people who are doing apprenticeships. So there's quite a lot of job opportunities um, in horticultural education. And many horticultural educators um, do it alongside their other work. Um, so I was part time for a long time teaching while I was also a garden designer and working with my family business in production as well. So quite a lot of these areas of horticulture can be worked in um, simultaneously. Then another rapidly growing area of horticulture is environment and conservation. And horticulturalists are helping with growing plants and actually doing the activities of habitat restoration, conservation, visitor management um, in sensitive sites, for example. So several of our lecturers who teach horticulture, for example, in our courses, are environmentalists and they run projects like beaver reintroduction projects and then they look at the impact of the beavers on the biodiversity and the plants in the areas that they manage. So they're horticulturalists also and environmentalists. And finally at the bottom there, um, science and research. So there's a lot of crop science going on. Some of that sits within the agriculture space and some of it sits within the horticulture space. Uh, there's a lot of crossover, um, but sort of more purely within the horticulture area, there's a lot of plant physiology going on, um, research, there's plant trials, there's introduction of new varieties of ornamental plants, for example, there's genetic modification going on, a uh, lot of sort of seed science. So it's a, a quite a big area of horticulture as well as the sort of more 
pure science and, and research area. So it's very diverse. So what has horticulture done for us? Its benefits are very widespread and there's just a few on here. Food security is becoming ever more important. We saw with some of the um, supply lines having troubles during Brexit that very quickly, within a few days of there being a supply line problem, we have no fruit and veg on our shelves. So horticulture within the UK or within any country really helps with the food security of that area. Locally grown produce being sold to local people really helps with food security. And councils and the government are looking um, much more into that and what we can do to grow food locally and use food locally. <laughs> we produce medicines in horticulture, so we grow the plants and actually do quite a lot of the um, processing of the plant material um, to produce medicines. And not only the medicines that you might think that come from plants, um, that might be things like um, St John's wort and things that are maybe recognisable um, when you would buy them in a pharmacy, but actually lots of other medicines that you would never even know were plant derived. Um, so there's quite a lot of crop growing going on for medicines. And of course, the production of cannabis um, is a really strong growing area of horticulture also. Um, nutrition. So horticulture really benefits nutrition. Um, horticulture grows a lot of fruit um, and vegetables, um, lots of particularly on the on the fruit side, but also on the salad crop side sits within horticulture rather than the other vegetables that sit more within the agriculture realm. Um, a lot of the horticultural crops are very vitamin rich and so the nutrition um, quality of them is very high. So generally horticulture contributes to um, health also. Also therapeutic health, as I already discussed, and soil health, uh, which is hiding in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, horticulture done well protects um, and regenerates our soils. Um, at the top we have habitat restoration, improving, um, improving biodiversity and carbon capture, which are all things that horticulture contributes to massively. And then all of these things together um, have economic benefit. So here's some other um, common opinions about horticulture, that it's low paid and it's for people who didn't do very well in school. And we see this still coming through in the schools quite a lot, that people think that uh, maybe guidance teachers quite often think that, oh, you'd go into horticulture if you're not very academic, for example. So let's explore that for a few minutes. And I think the answer to it is yes and no. You can come into horticulture having not done very well in school, having not enjoyed school. Um, horticulture is for people who are maybe not so enthusiastic academically. There's lots of opportunities for entry level good jobs, some of them not particularly well paid, but most of them with really good career progression possibilities. And so horticulture is an excellent choice for people who didn't necessarily really enjoy their school experience, didn't get particularly good grades. But that's not only who it's for. People come into horticulture at all of these levels and they progress on to lots of other levels. They also leave from all of these sorts of levels into employment. So we'll have a look at that. So we've got sort of levels sort of one to four, which is our more basic practical horticulture skills with a little of the theory side, a little bit of horticultural science. And people um, who study at sort of levels one to four, if they come into education in horticulture, um, can leave at that stage into a really wide range of entry level positions, working um, as um, plant propagators, for example, garden centre assistants, um, gardeners doing maintenance. Um, there's a lot of uh, jobs for people with a quite basic level of education. And many people who go into that then are promoted because they've gained their skills when they're at work. Lots of people decide to take on an apprenticeship from that point and improve their education that way, or literally just to learn on the job um, and they gain their experience and end up managing or potentially owning some of these businesses. 
people who stay on in education um, or who come in with a slightly higher level of education from school might come into a level five or six course, um, which is a sort of more competent level of practical and a good mixture of theory and they're starting to learn a bit about plant physiology and photosynthesis, things like that. And people who come out at level five or six will have quite a high level of confidence and practical skills um, and will be able to go in to an entry level job in horticulture with quite little training. They'd be able to go in and take up a garden maintenance job, a job on a nursery, a job in a garden centre. They'd be able to identify the plants, carry out the tasks required for everything other than the most sort of specialised tasks. Um, then we go over into higher education, so moving up a little bit um, to HNC and HND level. And this is where um, people develop more specialist or more advanced practical skills, um, specialist pruning techniques, specialist propagation techniques like grafting and things. But also they start to build their scientific um, background if they're staying on an education at this level. Um, so they're starting to develop their scientific theory. Um, they're building up their scientific skills, their lab skills um, in case they want to carry on to a higher level. Um, because if you do a degree in horticulture, then it is a science degree. Alongside those kind of skills, the practical side and the science side, they also learn about environment, um, about setting up community projects, about therapeutic horticulture, and they do business startup and management skills. So coming out of an HNC or an HND, somebody might expect to go into um, a sort of either higher skilled level horticulture job or a management job, maybe a head gardener of a, a smaller garden, something like that. Um, keeping going from there, you can do a degree or an honours degree, which is really where your scientific skills are advanced. And <coughs> excuse me, you start to do your independent scientific research and you start to work on those skills. And then keeping going into masters and uh, doctoral degrees. Um, if people want to stick with the scientific pathway, they can go all the way through in horticulture. Um, and certainly on our courses, we have um, one of our lecturers who's a doctor of uh, plant physiology, um, who teaches our science side of it, for example, and who worked in plant breeding programs, breeding chrysanthemums for a long time. So there's a lot of um, possibility to keep going with education, but also to leave at any stage of education into a big range of jobs. So I think the answer is to the previous question, you know, is it just for people who didn't do very well in school? No, but yes, it is for those people, but it's also for everybody else at all other levels. And so people might want to come into horticulture with a really good set of um, science hires, for example, and come straight into an HNC, HND and go through to do a horticultural science degree. So just um, a quick example of the sort of routes that you could do if you came to um, UHI, for example. Okay. So we have students studying in school with us um, at levels four and five. We also have students studying in college with us at levels four and five. And at the top route, they can go through up into higher education on the sort of academic side through their HNC and HND, and then they can go on to do um, uh, degrees at other institutions. Or we also deliver apprenticeships. So we have people who are based at work um, and who are assessed on their competence at work by our assessors. So that is all from me. Um, very open to any questions that anybody has um, and also very happy for people to contact me if they'd like to afterwards, if they have any questions about getting into a career in horticulture. Thank you so much for that, Amber. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I guess, I mean, I know for myself, we've been learning so much about horticulture in this job, but I guess my kind of immediate question to you is obviously, it's very clear that no two days are the same. What has been the best day for you in your career in horticulture? Because it seems that there's so many different elements to this. So what has been like your most memorable and favourite day so far in your entire career of horticulture? I think, um... My best day was when I was a student doing my HND garden design course and I found out that I'd got 
into Chelsea Flower Show to do a show garden there. It was so exciting and it pulled together so many of the different elements of things that I'd done before. We had a scientific aspect of it. We had we were producing the plants ourselves, so I was using those skills that I'd learned. And I was using my garden design skills for the first time in a public environment. So I think it was probably that day where I realised that all of these bits and pieces that I had done in my education um, and experience and jobs in horticulture pulled together to be able to show a design, you know, to such a wide audience. It was so very exciting. <laughs>